Yeah, I'm from Seattle where we've been rained out really bad this uh, this winter. Um, so my name is Davis Patterson, and uh, I am just so grateful that UC Davis invited us here to talk about the rural workforce. And I'm joined by Dr. Leanna Muski, who is uh, our Dean of Admissions. And so I'm from the University of Washington School of Medicine. And I think I, I just have to say, I have not been in a meeting for work with anyone since February 2020. I'm a full-time researcher. I can do it all from home. And I'm just like overwhelmed and, and excited just to like, see people and like this is the perfect meeting to start out with this is this is like these are my people kind of meeting so anyway i'm just so thrilled to be here and see faces and and um, anyway so um so we're going to talk about the rural health workforce and um the the whammy trust program and so i'm going to talk about rural workforce issues um i know this is an admissions focused meeting but i'm going to also dive into other areas beyond admissions um, and then uh, liana is going to take a deeper dive into the whammy um, uh, trust program and talk and share her thoughts about um, healthy medical education ecosystems so uh, so uh, i i direct the whammy rural health research center and for those who don't know whammy comes from Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, because that's the five state region that our medical school serves. Um, and, uh, and so we are funded by HRSA. I also um, direct Rural Prep, which is another HRSA funded uh, research center, which is specifically focused on uh, primary care. Um, and so we're very grateful to have had the funding from HRSA and they very much support the work that I'm gonna present. Um, also have to issue this disclaimer that these are my opinions and uh, the government doesn't necessarily endorse them, but they definitely are supportive. So um, I just wanna give a few snapshots of, of rural urban workforce disparities, probably not news to anybody, but just good to kind of set the context. This by the way is a, a photo from a hike in uh, Southeast Washington in the Palouse region in the springtime and the canola is uh, blooming and it's gorgeous. Um, my brother lives in that area. So uh, again, these are just snapshots to give you a flavor. So 60% of rural counties um, had no active general surgeon in 2019. And, and general surgeons are just critical to rural health systems. Um, and what's not on this slide is actually uh, that general surgery has been declining both in urban and rural, but particularly in rural over the last 20 years. Um, this is a map that shows uh, rural counties, and though the white counties are the ones that don't have that the particular kind of clinician. These are uh, rural counties with no um, OB clinicians, so that means no OBGYNs, uh, no certified nurse midwives or other midwives, and no family physicians who deliver babies or report that they deliver babies. And so, and you can see um, there's quite a few. There's sort of a pattern in the middle, a bit more of a swath there, but really it's pretty widespread. And 40% of non-core counties, which are the smaller, more remote counties, um, have no uh, OB clinicians. Now with primary care, um, we're a little bit better off, but of course it depends on where you are. Um, and so this shows you metropolitan and then micropolitan and non-core, which is what we consider rural. Uh, in these analyses. And so you can see, actually family physicians are the one clinician where the more rural you go, the more concentrated they are. Um, NPs and PAs are a significant and growing part of the rural uh, primary care workforce as well. Um, they are less plentiful in rural, but they're still very substantial. Um, not so many uh, um, internal medicine or pediatrician uh, physicians in rural though. Okay, so those are just, you know, so there's clearly rural urban disparities. Uh, so what works when we want to produce a rural workforce? This, by the way, is a picture of Lake Chelan in Chelan, Washington, a pretty gorgeous area. And it's either rural or urban, depending on what federal classification system you use. So we could talk about rural definitions um, all day too. That's another thing, but I think it's pretty rural. So uh, colleagues in my center did a study looking at uh, what are the factors that predict whether a PA program produces rural PAs. And so this is the distribution of the percentage of rural PAs by program. This was back in 2012. Um, there's quite a few more programs now, but there were about 150 programs. And so you can see here, 
one program produces over you know over 80 percent of their graduates are uh, go rural um, and then all the way down to zero on the other end so uh, but around 13 percent um, uh, uh, as, as a mean uh, go into rural practice. And so we did a regression model and controlled for a number of factors, um, or I should say my, my colleagues, I wasn't involved in the study, uh, and found that looking at a number of different things, programs that produce a rural pay, PAs tend to have, um, tend to say that doing that is very important to their mission or their goals. Um, they actively recruit rural students. Um, they and then what do they do when they get there? They have a rural didactic curriculum, and also they require rural family medicine rotations uh, in clinical training. So all of those things are important for, for producing rural PAs. We also did a study. Uh, this is looking at Pacific Northwest University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, they're a newer medical school, and this is their, these are their first cohorts of graduates. Um, we just did this study with PNWU last year, and PNWU is a high producer of rural physicians. So 19% of their graduates um, go to rural communities uh, coming out of medical school, which is uh, quite phenomenal. They're in the top, um, I forget what ranking, but they're in the top three nationally. Um, and so this study was really interesting for us because we had access to all kinds of data. We had, um, you know, where did they grow up? We had their college information. We had their personal statements that we coded for various factors that we thought might be important. We had their medical school experiences and residency. So we had a ton of data about these students, and we were able to isolate those predictors that led to rural practice. And we had three that emerged in our statistical model. Um, so hmm, this, oh, this is the word. This is the Windows to uh, Apple translation issue. Um, anyway, so what you can't quite see here. So um, let me see if I can remember what it says. Uh, rural. Okay. So on the left there is rural intent. So if their application uh, personal statement said that they intended to go into rural practice, that was a a predictor. Um, the middle one is uh, oh greater than wow. It's really greater than eight weeks of rural rotations in medical school so doing rural experiences and then this one is attending a rural residency so wanting to be a, a rural physician uh, doing rural rotations in medical school and rural residency those were the three predictors out of everything and so importantly pnw was really interested in this because they wanted to know what could we get from the application rural intent so i think they're going to be looking at that in their applications in the future this is another study. This is a national study, but it's looking specifically at producing rural primary care physicians. Um, so this is all the medical school, schools at the time that we did this study arrayed in terms of their proportion of rural primary care graduates. And so you can see uh, you know, almost none here, all the way up to about 12% of graduates from the top producer, which is, um, I'm blanking on it, Pikeville uh, in Kentucky. So anyway. Um, we wanted to know what predicts if you're going to end up in that top 20% of rural producers. And we uh, looked at a variety of fact, institutional factors. And so one is, is a school in a rural location? There aren't very many of them, but that was a predictor. Um, is rural in the mission statement? So again, mission is a really important thing. Osteopathic schools do better at this than, and than allopathic schools. And then, um, interestingly, we found we developed a measure of scholarly output, like how many papers came out of this medical school on rural health, and that's one of the four predictors. We did another study looking at rurally targeted medical school admissions, and so this is a little bit closer to, to the purpose of this meeting. Um, and uh, so we surveyed uh, admissions deans, Leanna, I hope, I, I hope you participated. Uh, I, think you, I think someone said that you did. I think Dave said that you did. Uh, anyway, we got a good response rate, 72%. Uh, and uh, we wanted to know, um, do you have rurally targeted admissions? In other words, are you, is one of your goals to produce a, a rural uh, workforce? Um, and then what do you do with them? And what kinds of applicants do you target, et cetera? And um, curiously, and I think this gets to, I think it was Mart's comment about, you know, stated versus, you know, actual mission. I don't know. But I, you know, 69% reported rurally targeted admissions, which is a lot. So it seems like we should be doing better uh, at producing rural physicians. 
And, um, oh, okay. Yeah, so um, we, oh, wow, this is really gonna, okay. I'm gonna need a little time to walk you through this. So what we did was we um, asked about a variety of different strategies. So this one over on the left that's circled, this is about um, providing career awareness mentoring motivational kinds of activities and um, and the different color bars so the dark green is high school then you have community college then you have four year and then you have a post back program so that's the the way the shading goes uh, so anyway we wanted to know at what level are you targeting students on the pathway and by which strategies and so that's what this is all about and i'm going to show you a few of these so you can see those motivational and awareness kinds of things are the most common strategy over there on the left. Um, there was also academic enhancement, I think, that one there. Uh, wow, I'm really blanking on this. This is articulation agreements, and so this is like conditional acceptance, having a formal, oh, you've got it there. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, so anyway. Academic enhancement, uh, maybe admissions prep. Admissions. I think that's, yes, admissions. admissions. So helping with the admissions process, that's what that is. Okay, all right, so that's the one. So point is, what most of the schools are doing is this sort of awareness and motivation. Um, let's see if I can make sense of this one. This is, oh, just to make the point that with all the strategies, naturally, schools are targeting four-year universities. That seem, I said naturally because that's when the, tr the traditional way of uh, developing the pathway. But uh, to Dr. Talmante's point earlier and what other people have been talking about, we were really um, kind of encouraged to see attention to community colleges with these various, various strategies as well. Um, and so I think that bodes well for diversifying uh, the pipeline and then I just wanted to point out that this, this really high investment strategy, I would say, which is when you have a formal uh, agreement, an articulation agreement, um, is also a strategy that schools are using. And you know, two out of five schools who target rural uh, students that are going to go rural use that strategy. So I'm really curious about that, and I'd like to do a little bit more investigating into what's going on there. What, what sorts of arrangements do they, do they have? So um, I also want to talk about residency training uh, because this is most proximal to practice, right? And we know from other studies that it's really an important predictor of practice, um, not just our own work that we shared, but others. Um, and so we found, uh, we've looked at both early career and later career physicians, whether they went to a rural residency program or an urban residency program. This is in family medicine. And both groups, I mean, through their careers, Rural residency graduates are five times as likely to be in rural practice as uh, physicians that went to urban residencies. And, um, and so that what that adds up to is more rural workforce years over your career, uh, your whole career. And there's another study that we did that sort, that sort of quantified the rural workforce contribution over time. All right, so I've talked about some disparities. I've talked about some of the uh, predictors. Um, there are challenges to doing this, though, and hopefully solutions, which are opportunities. Uh, so obviously, I think we know, not just from the work that we've done, but many others, that rural place-based education is really the key to preparing, uh, recruiting, preparing, and retaining cl clinicians. And, um, but the problem is it's really scarce, right? So the question is, when we, when we want to admit rural students or rural focused students, what are we inviting them to? What are they going to be, get to do when they get into medical school residency? And so only about 10% of all slots in family medicine are rural, which is less than the rural population. Um, and then all the other specialties in, in medicine combined, there's even fewer. Um, We've also looked at, uh, now more and more NPs are doing postgraduate training, about 10% reported they were doing that in 2018 nationally. Um, and there are more and more of these uh, residencies and fellowships for, for NPs. Um, we've identified in a study that we did last year, 20 that are rural or rural serving, but you know we're talking about small numbers here, right? Um, and this is to help in the transition to, to rural practice. Um, the biggest challenge that NP and PA programs report is competition for those rural placements. 
And uh, so both of them said that's their top major barrier. Either they're competing with other PA programs or NP programs, or guess who? Medical schools, right? It's kind of an arms race. Uh, and so um, that's an issue that we need to fix because there just aren't enough rural placements for, for students that want to do them and schools that want to use them. So um, to finish my part, I just want to talk about what I call rural-centric workforce policies and practices. Um, and so we've got to have those pathways to recruit, prepare, and retain rural professionals. Um, resources are not equitable, and that means all the way back to K-12 rural urban. We know that, that rural students have some disadvantages compared to urban, um, and that, that's you know, similar to the kinds of things that we talked about around uh, um, other underrepresented groups. Uh, we have to have collaborative interprofessional models to maximize those scarce rural placements, and there are ways to do this. Um, we want to have scopes of practice that use the workforce we have to maximum capability, um, and that's also an, an attractor like into family medicine, if you can practice a broad scope, there's a lot of people that say, yeah, I want to do that, and I can do that in rural. Um, we haven't talked about this much at all in this meeting, but we also need to think about other types of health professionals that, that can bolster the whole team, right? And that's going to be an attractor, too, when you've got that support of people like community health workers, uh, community paramedics, dental therapists, and these new types of, of uh, health professionals. And so I'm going to pause there, and I don't know how we're doing on time. OK. And just um, and that's Sedona, if you don't recognize it. And that's one place that I was able to go during the pandemic, which was great uh, to get some fresh air and sunshine. Um, so I just wanted to pause for a second before I turn it over to uh, Leanna, who's going to take a deeper dive into our WAMI uh, uh, trust program. But, just reactions, thoughts, does any of this resonate with you? Comments, anything at this point before we move on? What yeah. are the largest barriers to having more rural residents? Oh, there's, there's, there are many. <laughs> oh, yeah. Barriers to having more rural residency sites. Yeah. I mean, you name it uh, finances, uh, some of the accreditation requirements. Um, for small programs can struggle to meet some of those um, not enough and when I say financing now some of that is changing because there has been federal legislation that are en enabling more rural uh, programs and alternative uh, programs and so that's a that's a bright spot and and CMS I think they might have just they just released their guidance on uh, the rules and there was a lot of contention about that part of interpreting the legislation to make sure that it wasn't going to leave rural out. Um, anyway, I could go. I could go on, but yeah, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was one in the in the Pacific Northwest University study. We had that information, and so um, and that you know many studies have shown if you come from a rural background, you're more likely to. But there might be some things along the way that dissuade you. Um, and if we only look for rural students, that isn't going to get us there. And so that but that rural intent, you know, one could maybe probably trace a pathway. I bet rural students more often have a rural intent. Um, but that wasn't one of the final predictors in our model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the factors is that so many rural hospitals are closed. You can't have a family medicine residency without a hospital site for family docs to train. That's true. Absolutely, yeah, and stabilized a little bit during the pandemic. But um, I'll I'll do one more question and then I'll. Oh yeah, go ahead. There, I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Um, 
Yeah. So challenges in, in the ur urban training sites and yeah, and it's sort of a domino effect. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, sure. Are you Can the PERSA's definition of rural, Department of Agriculture's <laughs> definition of rural, or a metropolitan statistical area definition? Because PERSA's is the most restrictive so that most residencies, even the ones we classify as rural, are not do not have an address in PERSA's rural designated area. So depends on which study we're looking at we've used different ones and it partly depends on the data sources right um so yeah <laughs> i use ruca codes when i can uh, which is slightly more restrictive than the federal office of rural health policy in hersa so um but that's a whole set of questions but anyway i want to make sure that leanna has enough time but thank thank you all for your reactions and yeah. questions thank you i'll we'll just do a little dance and switch places if that's okay yeah that's great Perfect. Thank you. So I am uh, needing the clicker. Uh -huh. And uh, I am also um, sort of reveling in this with uh, Davis and I think others. Just it's fun to be in a room with people. I haven't actually stood up in front of people and talked about anything in a very long time. So forgive me for um, what's about to happen. Um, oh, and this is going to be my stroll all along. Um, Darn the Mac to PC transition. So uh, I was asked by Davis, and so the, the little secret behind this is that we've never actually met before. Um, we work for the same uh, university system and have for a long time, turns out. Um, but we have never crossed paths before this, and we met for the first time on Zoom a month or so ago, and we decided to do this together. But I was honored to be able to um, to ask to come and, and speak here about some of the work that we're doing at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So she's going to help me out here, but uh, so I'll just say, uh, forgive me for not also greeting you appropriately, Kisu uh, Kukit, which means good day in my Kootenai language. I'm Leanna Muski. I'm Salish and Kootenai. I'm from the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana, where I currently reside and I work from. And I, I did that pre-pandemic. So I serve as the Associate Dean for Admissions for the School of Medicine at the University of Washington. And so, um, and I've been involved with medical education since I graduated from residency many years ago and um, really had always had an interest in admissions. I worked as an admissions um, recruitment counselor in, after undergrad for my state university. And I just really have passion, as do some of the people who you heard before. And we tend to talk fast when we're passionate about something, right? So um, from the auctioneers earlier, thank you, that's lovely, um, that we have a lot of passion around this, around mentorship, around building communities, around making the, you know, sort of spaces more appropriate, more hospitable, um, and a place for our, our people to thrive so that our communities can be better in, in the end. So what I, I'm going to approach talking about today, and I will say that this is a huge topic and we don't have a lot of time, but building upon, you know, sort of specifically the needs within rural communities, um, how do we sort of approach those issues that um, Davis has raised um, in earlier in his talk? So thinking about um, wanting to target desired populations. So I come from the admissions perspective in medical education. We've heard a lot about that today, about some of the barriers that we've had and some of the solutions that creative institutions are, are approaching. Um, and really, so part of this is, is really, who do you want in your institution? And, and how do you target those? So rural, underrepresented groups, disadvantaged folks, whatever your target population is, we're gonna talk a little bit more today about um, a specific uh, targeted admissions program for rural, but I think the application to whatever your target group is, um, is can be universal. Um, and I just wanted to couple that with what you've also heard from perhaps um, in our in our plenary sessions earlier, and if you were in this room earlier um, before us, um, hearing about holistic review and the and the premise of that and the importance of that. But in our, our context, it really is about um, training our committee, having transparency, and then also educating our community, our educators, the rest of the folks that belong to what I like to do call the ecosystem, so you'll hear that over and over, as opposed to sort of the pipeline, which for me holds a, some connotations that perhaps, you know, are troublesome, particularly in, in native communities across the country. When you start talking about pipelines, there can be um, a little bit of uh, 
consternation about that. So, and pipelines are unidirectional, they break, they leak, there are problems with them. So I believe in e ecosystem building and I think that's sort of part of how we do it. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background. <laughs> University of Washington School of Medicine is the five state regional medical school um, that serves the states of Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Therefore comes the acronym WAMI, which you'll hear throughout. And we have six foundation sites for preclinical medical education. So we partner with all of these university systems to train our medical students at their in their home states or in their campus of choice in Washington State um, in their preclinical phase, which is about 18 to 24 months, um, depending on how that goes, um, in the first couple of years of their medical education. When we think about WAMI and why this is relevant to um, our rural workforce needs, um, you, it takes up about 27% of the landmass of the United States and uh, only about 3.3% of the population of the country. So it's very rural. Much of it is actually considered frontier um, and going back to definitions of, you know, sort of how do you classify communities? Um, we could talk about that probably all day as well. Um, but we do offer clinical, this is a map and it's very busy and I don't expect you to be able to actually see any of it, but just know that all of those spots are clinical um, training sites across the five states that our students have the opportunity to um, learn in, and it's across all five states. So what I wanted to focus on was because of the disparities that we've heard earlier today, because of the information that's been shared throughout, um, I think, our gathering today, we recognize that there are just certain parts of our community, of, of our region that are remain underserved. And so, you know, folks have been thinking about how do you approach this for a long time? Many medical schools have created rural training programs, rural training tracks, et cetera, et cetera. And so we jumped on that train as well sometime. Um, and, and we've had a rural commitment and much of our clinical training was just by nature and de facto was done in rural communities. So we had some specific programming that had been built along the way um, as the whammy sort of region has matured over time and, and students had the opportunities to maybe spend four weeks of their summer between first and second year in a rural community or they could choose to do a longitudinal kind of clinical experience in one community um, you know, or they could have a rural, one clerkship in a very rural location just so they had the experience. So those were sort of built in by nature into our, our, our curriculum. However, what we were finding then is that while we do very well in primary care and we actually do pretty well in rural um, workforce, we weren't doing as well as we needed to. We're behind the the, the chase just like everybody else. So somewhere around 2008, um, and just before that, I, I should say, probably 2006, 2007, a group came together and said, how do we, what do we do? The, the why was there, the now what is next, right? So what do we do? So they strategized a, a rural kind of training program, took it to the powers that be who said, uh, we don't have money to fund that, sorry, put that back on the shelf. And so, one of our uh, partners, um, the clinical dean in Montana, said, well, if we can't do it university, the school five state campus wide, how about we do a smaller version in Montana and see if we run a pilot that way? So um, Dr. Jay Erickson, who's been a mentor of mine, who's a clinical dean in Montana, said, uh, let's just try this. Let's say, what if we targeted rural students? We had a targeted admissions program. We created a four-year uh, uh, longitudinal um, program that really immersed our students into a rural um, experience and then coupled that with mentorship and training and perhaps even on a national level. What would all of that look like? How do we do that? Piloted it and said, um, you know, let's give it a try. So he did it on a much smaller level before in introducing it into the entire um, institution. So we had a pilot program that eventually was very successful. And our one of our first, so it started off um, asking for volunteers. There wasn't a targeted or a, sorry, a, a separate admissions process or anything. They just asked for three, or some volunteers, they got three in an entering class in the Montana cohort, which at the time was only 20 students. So three of the 20 decided they were gonna participate in this program. They paired them with a rural community. Um, they had an experience before they even matriculated for a couple of weeks, and then they um, had some contact throughout their first year, 
And between the first and second year, they spent four weeks doing um, uh, a clinical experience. And then they did uh, a longitudinal experience in their clerkship years. The great story about that is that one of those graduates actually um, matched into the family medicine residency in Montana. Uh, Pre, uh, an early decision match because she was a trust scholar in that community and um, so so matched there and then she eventually went back to serve that community that she was a trust student for that she had volunteered for so she sort of completed the full circle she's now on faculty and is a trust um, faculty person in another small community in Montana so and there are a handful of those anecdotal stories that we could share um, forever but this is sort of how it's set up um, in 2021 uh, a group of our co my colleagues including Dr. Erickson um, and others looked at the trust scholars from 2009 to 2014 um, and tried to determine some outcomes how are we doing what does this look like what are we producing and is this working um, so there, the study actually took 156 students who applied to the trust program because eventually we had a, a separate admissions uh, procedure. And um, so looked at all 156 people who applied to trust. And then of those, 102 of them were selected as trust scholars. And then there were 54 of them who were accepted to the School of Medicine um, but were not accepted as trust scholars. So they were accepted as general MD seeking students. So those were the control group. Looked at match rates into family medicine. Using that sort of as the proxy for perhaps eventually going into rural and um, primary care or the other um, rural uh, specialties. So using family medicine as the proxy and then looked at other needed workforce specialties is what I was saying in the rural areas like pediatrics, internal medicine, surgery and psychiatry because as we heard earlier, those um, areas are also highly sought after in our small communities. Okay, so super busy table. I don't expect you to sort of know this but know it's in there if you really wanna take a deep dive. And I would say that the paper is a, is a great read and it's um, uh, publicly available if you'd like to sort of look at it. But this really looked at what are some of the characteristics and match outcomes of those 156 students that they looked at. So they looked at non-accepted students and accepted students. And really what they recognized was, um, here, I'll just tell you, <laughs> that accepted trust scholars versus um, UW School of Medicine students who were not accepted to trust were less likely to be from a community near an urban center. Going back to the definitions, I can't tell you exactly like what qualified as urban and, and rural, but if they were not from a community near an urban center, they were our trust scholars were also less likely to have accessibility to an urban center. Uh, they reported less interest in practicing in high, with high urban accessibility. They had a lower interest in specialty practice and they had a lower interest in academic practice. So selecting for those students, actually the trust students were more likely to, to have these characteristics. Um, but when we looked at predictors of family medicine match, the only true predictor, um, if you look at the odds ratio column here, um, the only true predictor of matching into family medicine, which again we used as the proxy for going into um, uh, rural healthcare eventually, uh, was listing family medicine as their specialty choice um, upon matriculation. So when they stated what they wanted to do eventually if you were if you stated you wanted to do family medicine you were more likely to match um, outside of all of these other things that they looked at which is just being accepted to trust you can see they're pretty equal um, or maybe even less likely um, if you were uh, had a specialty interest of course you were lower if you had lower maternal education that didn't seem to matter looking at um, sort of one measure of social economic status um, and that was if mom had a high school or less education, planned a practice either in an accessible community or close to urban area, distance, academic. If you participated in a family medicine interest group, seemingly didn't seem to make a difference if you ended up going into family medicine or not, which was interest, um, even though we all enjoy that activity if you're in family medicine. The other outcome was who, um, who matches into family medicine just based on if you apply to trust and were not accepted, if you were a trust scholar or if, um, 
or it, uh, compared nationally, and you can just see it varied for trust scholars over the course of the several years that they looked, but if you look at the mean, um, it's much higher than either. Nationally, it's significantly higher, and even those folks who were accepted into the School of Medicine um, without being in the trust program, it was also higher. Um, I think I just said that. And so really it's sort of hard because this, even though the trust program started so long ago, the numbers were small in terms of it was a pilot program in one state across our five state region. The numbers in each state are small. Even today, Alaska, for example, Alaska generally has two, sometimes three trust scholars per academic year. Um, Montana is now up to 12 because they have, um, you know, really cultivated that community of teaching within the state of Montana. Um, but rural focused programs in medical school attract students with rural ties with likelihood for higher rates of matching into family medicine, again, the proxy for going rural, and that a holistic admissions process should be given weight to, should give weight to rural background experiences or rural attributes, because that's what our current process does now um, when we're going for it. So I just wanted to pause and just say, the, the one thing that I didn't spend a lot of time talking to you about, because I'm feeling pressure to get all of this in, <laughs> um, was that our admissions process, so, so now in all five states, in all six foundation sites actually accept trust students, and we do it through in a separate admissions process. So they go through the regular admissions process, but they have a supplemental um, secondary question that they need to complete that has um, that is solely dedicated to trust. They're asked some questions, and then they're actually interviewed separately for t as a trust scholar. As you can see from the data, the um, if they're not accepted as a trust scholar because those are limited seats, they may still also be accepted for regular admission into the School of Medicine. But we um, we educate our committee on what it means to be a trust scholar so that they know the attributes that we're looking for. We advertise, you know, sort of in our messaging and in our education materials, all of the requirements to be a trust scholar are. Um, are public for everybody to know about. We also, the one thing, question that we have, there is no, there's no payback, there's no, um, you know, sort of obligation if you're a trust scholar that you have to return. We're just hopeful that the experience is such that it enhances what you started with as your passion and what you bring to the table um, to go on and, and serve in a rural community. Um, funding sources for it is started with a, um, a bit of a, uh, I think a seed HRSA grant. Um, it eventually landed in our Department of Family Medicine who supports it with an, uh, we actually have an Office of Rural Programs now that sort of grew out of all of these experiences. So, and we also, Montana had a, had a good um, injection of funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield when they were growing their program as well. So lots of different funding sources in order to sustain such a program. The shift in focus now that I want to take, and I don't know where we are in time. You're gonna, okay, gonna finish this uh, sprint. Um, is just this messaging around ecosystem building, because the other piece of this is that the way that the trust program has been successful is that it started with this idea that lots of us have around the need for growing a rural workforce, but it really is not just about finding the people who want to, I think we heard this earlier in, in some messaging, and we keep hearing it, but not just finding the people that want to become rural docs, but really figuring out how do we support that all the way through. And so thinking about this in that context, as I said, I'm not a big fan of like pipeline programs or how do you, you know, sort of just bringing them for the sake of your numbers looking better and your data sort of looking better, but really thinking about medical education as an ecosystem and um, that there are many components and there's lots of pieces to it and we all play a part in that in, in maintaining and um, in, in sustaining a healthy ecosystem. So just in that context, the definition of a healthy ecosystem is one that's sustainable, right? That it's got its ability to maintain its structure. So there's some scaffolding from on which we all stand on the platform 
there, but which includes organization as well as biodiversity. It uh, has the ability to function over time and in the face of external stresses, and we call that the vigor and the resilience of an ecosystem, right? So medicine is constantly changing. All of the players in healthcare, in the healthcare workforce have had to change and adapt. I think somebody said earlier that the pandemic taught us lots of things about a lot of things, but it really is, and it challenged, I think, the resilience and the vigor of the medical education ecosystem. Key factors to an, a healthy ecosystem has biotic things, abiotic things, social cultural um, factors. So there's living components, the non-living, and then all of the social and cultural components that go along with it. And then an ecosystem gets challenged by stressors and the responses to those challenge sort of determine whether or not it continues to be sustainable um, and, and can go on. Um, and those include its resilience, adaptability, and transformability. And I think today what we've also heard is we look for those <laughs> characteristics in our students, we look for them in the folks that teach our students, all of those pieces, but in the ecosystem as a whole, I think those are really important. So to give you sort of examples of what, are, what those things are, so the biotic, of course, are the students, faculty, the people, right? So those are the living, breathing parts of our medical education ecosystem, the abiotic things. We heard a wonderful presentation just before this about a clinical sim lab for American Indian Alaska Native students that's, that is an abiotic part of it, but it's also part of the social and cultural um, piece that really helps not just the ecosystem survive, but it's really gonna help that ecosystem thrive and for those particular students. Um, a medical education ecosystem's ability to respond to change. So these are how you can measure some of these things. The resilience, which you have, if you're able to bring different learners in different cohorts, but the system doesn't get disruptive and fall apart, right? So this charge for those of us in the admissions world to diversify your student body. Well, what does that mean? And when we do that, does it cause your ecosystem to crumble because you've now introduced change and perhaps disruption? So we're looking for our ecosystem to be, dis to be resilient. It also needs to have adaptability for those different learners who are coming for the different ideas around medicine for advances. Can you be adaptable? Can the learning environment adapt and change without also imploding or falling apart? And then transformability. This is an example of the trust program or any of the other programs that are targeting specific um, needs. So you develop a rural training program because of workforce needs. And I should say, pause, that. It, much of this is described in a paper that came out, I think, in 2017 um, in medical education, <clears throat> excuse me, out of the University of Alberta, which as I got into um, medical school admissions, I really, I had a, a mentor who does a lot of community building within the medical education world, particularly with native communities. And we were on a walk one day um, talking about things. She came out to my clinic site and helped facilitate some, um, some cultural proficiency sort of work with the, my clinical partners. And we started talking about the medical education system and water, because we happened to be taking a walk by a river that led to a dam. and. Um, and so we, we really were likening it to an ecosystem. So this is um, not my drawing, <laughs> this is not my work, but when I you know, sort of looked for what is the sort of water ecosystem and thinking about healthy medical education ecosystems, can we use this as a visual to sort of start to think about all of the components that are necessary for our medical education ecosystem to be healthy? So I'm just wondering if, as you look at this, and I don't know if you can see it, but this is sort of the natural movement of water within the ecosystem. So starting at subsurfaces, the outflow, little evaporation comes around, creates our clouds, condenses, right? And then rains down, feeding, all and taking care of all of the land that it lands on as precipitation goes back into the water ecosystem, infiltrates down into the groundwater. All the meanwhile, there's a little bit of transpiration going on, right, that just happens naturally from the surrounding um, flora and fauna. So if you imagined um, a person as a drop of water in the medical education ecosystem, could you imagine what the, where does the pre-med student sort of fall on here? 
Any ideas, guesses? And these are, this is how I made it up, so there's no right answer. <laughs> Maybe I'll learn something today. Um, any guesses? I sort of put them somewhere at the bottom. So I sort of visualize them as the, you know, sort of down here. They're starting. They were born of something. They were part of the ecosystem. They sort of lived. Um, and then you can imagine where they're going to go next, right? So the medical student would be, right? So they're out in the atmosphere. They haven't formed quite yet. They're still just sort of floating around, right? And so we get them into the system. We work on them a little bit. They condense into a resident physician, right? So this is about particularly becoming a physician. So they become a resident physician, eventually raining down you know, all of your knowledge as you're an attending physician, you're precipitating onto communities and in spaces. And then the faculty becomes a runoff, so it's feeding back into the system. You have alumni, you have mentors who maybe aren't the actual direct teaching faculty, but they're the other folks that support a medical education system as sort of the runoff all around, right? So they're feeding um, the system as well. And I sort of think of our learning environment or our institutions in general as being the transpiration, um, as they're just out there and supporting the students the whole time. So that's my, like, sim my brain needed a simple model, but it's also sort of culturally baked into sort of how we think about water as Native people and the value and the importance of all of the parts of the um, ecosystem in order for it to be healthy and uh, thriving. And then, of course, there are other parts that are not water that are equally as important to the success and health of the ecosystem. So that is actually a picture of where I live. And so I get to see sort of the water ecosystem um, in reality all the time. But it does make me think of where are my students, where are the students that I'm interacting, whether they're thinking about medical education, whether they are in medical education, whether I'm teaching them directly or, you know, they're my colleagues or they're going off to residency, where are they sort of in this um, schematic? So sorry I took too much time. <laughs> um, we are happy to answer any questions about rural workforce. And Dr. Henderson says one question, and you well, get it. I want to take it away, but I was wondering, like, your, your, you said that uh, when your students enter in the trust data, they, they, their intent to pursue family medicine is just only for vision, right? Yeah. My question is, what is it that you do? Because every student, not every student, many True. students say something to me, and I'm like, and then it, it, it evolves or devolves or we beat it out of whatever. I mean, what do you think it is that maintains that? So the question is, what is it that, um, despite most medical state students saying they want to do family medicine when they enter medical school, what is it that we perhaps do that keeps them, you know, sort of on the path to pursue that? And I would say it's coming at them early and often. So in our curriculum, we do clinical experience within the first week of medical school. And for our trust students, they actually do a pre-matriculation two-week exposure into their um, trust community which are spread out all over in the rural areas so they get to go spend two weeks with those folks right off the bat and then during their preclinical education we all of our students do a, a fair amount of, of clinical experience um, but theirs is targeted at um, back with their their community um, their trust community so then their third year they go back to their trust community and then they can do electives and sub eyes with their trust preceptor so i think it's that get them early get them often keep them don't don't put any other shiny objects in front of them <laughs> there we go we we keep boosting them all along the way yes i love that i'll use that one instead of the shiny objects i think you had a question Right, so, I, so I, I don't know if I have the answer, me. Um, the question is, is there space, what is the space for ungra un, unmatched graduates who are interested in primary care, particularly rural, um, 
workforce. And I would say that is the challenge, right? Like there, that is a, is a question that's, that's big on many levels. Like we need to have enough residency spots for those folks who are interested and capable of doing that work. And so back to what we had talked about earlier about there just not being enough. Hopefully we're working on that. The other thing is where in the ecosystem could that you know, so could create could opportunities be created so that we do fill the gaps that we know we've known are coming. We've known this since I was in medical school that there's going to be a shortage in of primary care physicians, and I've heard it over and over and over. So, I, I think I don't have the answer to it, but it certainly is you know one of those pieces of the conversation that critically needs to be elevated, which I hope is why we're all coming here together. I don't know if you had an answer. I know that one of the biggest things that's a barrier for trying to match medical graduates is the admissions criteria. Because I know you all want fresh graduates or refreshers. Who many of us are you are a LM or we're underrepresented or systemically excluded. How can those of us who have older applications, who are older graduates, also integrate? Because we still have the passion to work in rural areas. So what I'm saying is. Year of graduation can often exclude people. Right. You're talking about year of graduation of undergraduate medical education? Yes. Yeah. That's correct. And I don't have a great answer to that. Um, I hear you, but I don't have a great answer to that question. Certainly something we should carry on as we move, you know, this conversation.